Hey, hello, how are you doing? How's everybody going? Pray all is well with you on today. Thank you for tuning in to Word Up Wednesdays. We are living in some really tough times. So let me say this first. I thank God for each and every person that is a part of Thy Will Be Done Christian Church and those who will be a part of this church, those who would choose to join this great fellowship. We're standing on good ground. God has called us to do a great work in the earth. We're not just called to shout in the sanctuary, but to serve in society, to engage, to encourage, to be empowered, and to know that we are called to do great things in God. We are called to come together and be a body of believers who allows God to use us in great ways. And in the times that we are living in, we truly need that. We need empowerment. We need to engage in relationships. We need to be encouraged. We need to be educated in God's word. And we need to execute his kingdom plan in the earth. I want to share this because I truly believe as God has given me a word for tonight to share. And I'm so excited about it. Entitled the Messiah's mentality. I'm also mindful that uh, the Lord also speak to us uh, regarding the times that we're living in. I've always been taught and trained as a minister of the gospel that not only should you be working on a sermon, but you should also have a newspaper available. And in the times that we live in, we got so many social media platforms that can always inform us about what's going on. Uh, Twitter, um, Google, uh, you name it. Even on here on Facebook, you know, we find out about so much. And some of the stuff we find out is good. It's pleasant. It makes us smile. But there are times there are things that we see that are totally devastating, they're discouraging, and they're disheartening. But God gave me a word uh, that I want to speak specifically uh, to what we're going through right now as a nation. And then we'll get into the lesson on tonight. I shared this on Facebook and I also share this also on our page as well. But um, I'm going to share this, what's going on in uh, Washington, D.C. at the uh, state capitol. Two words come to mind as I look at what's taking place in D.C. right now, and that's depravity and lawlessness. These actions don't just reflect a corrupt man, but sadly, the corrupt hearts of many. Those who have ignored the God of heaven and have become their own idol of choice. Only the light of the world, Jesus Christ, can illuminate and expose such darkness and set them free as we once were before salvation. But delusions of grandeur has blinded them from seeing their present reality and that is they're living in a well-lit prison in the depths of their souls, still asleep, and they refuse to be awakened. But the good news is that for God so loved the world, even in all the darkness, even in all of the despair and depression, even in all of the wretchedness and the wickedness, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Scripture speaks to us even in the Old Testament before that particular text in John 3, 16 was even written. Second Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then we will hear from heaven. God will forgive our sin and he will heal our land, the land that we live on, the motto of the United States, the land of the free and the home of the brave. The only way we're going to be free and the only way we can truly be brave is we meditate on the word of God day and night. And we allow him to lead us and guide us and direct us in the path that he will have for us. That's true success. That's true prosperity. That's true freedom. When we obey the truth that is here to set us free. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. I pray as a segue into the lesson on tonight that we received his mentality. That we position our heart posture to receive how God will have us to respond, not only to this moment that's going on in our nation, but as we anticipate Jesus Christ coming back as our Lord and our Savior, how we should live in the earth, fulfilling our purpose. That is my prayer always, that before any of us close our eyes on this side, that we will fulfill our purpose and reach our destiny that God has for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for this time to have this encounter, this holy encounter, to engage with you, our vertical relationship, and then also, God, to engage with the people of God that have tuned in on tonight, which is our horizontal relationships. Father, we honor you and we lift you up. Father, set a fire in our souls that we can't contain and that we can't control because we want more of you, God. Father, we ask you to forgive us for any of our sin. We bless your holy name 
We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. You are so amazing. You are so awesome. We pray that you will speak to us, speak to me as you have to teach your word, to encourage your people, to empower your people, to equip your people, that we may be the disciples, the followers of Jesus Christ that you call us to be. Thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit that comforts us, that convicts us, that daily reminds us, Father God, of everything that you call us to do according to your word. We bless you and we honor you and we lift you up. You are our protection. And that even in the midst of living in a world where people, some people, have no fear of you nor any regard for man, you're still our buckler and our shield. You are our protection, Father. We find safety in you. We bless you. Help us to focus more on you than what's going on around us so that we can execute the plan, the strategic plan that you have for us to do on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. I am so excited, so excited, so enthused about this lesson of developing the Messiah's mentality. Let me tell you the, the background of where this lesson was inspired. First, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but I had read the late, great Kobe Bryant's book, and I pray even now that the Lord will continue to comfort and heal his wife, Vanessa, and their daughters. I'm a huge, huge fan of Kobe Bryant. When he came in the league back in 1996, I was 12 years old. I remember when he won the dunk contest and his rough time in the playoffs, but how he just came up as definitely one of the greatest, not only two guards, but one of the best players to ever enter into the game. I watched all the championships, his Olympic gold medals. I watched his career and then even the greatness off the court. A great family man, loved his wife, loved his daughters. And I'm also praying for all the families that were involved in that, in that terrible tragedy going on a year ago, that Kobe, Gigi, and everyone that was on that helicopter uh, experience that God will continue to comfort and heal their families. But Kobe, while he was alive, he wrote a book called The, uh, the Mamba's Mentality. And in that book, uh, we got to see Kobe's uh, mentality of how he learned the game, how he approached the game, how he loved the game, and then how he lived out those principles of the game that he loved so much. And so, not only on tonight, but on the next uh, several weeks, and whenever the Lord says to switch up and do uh, a totally different lesson, but I thought it'd be befitting coming into this new year uh, that we start with the first things first. Jesus, who is the groom to the bride of Christ, the church, he started the church. He's the one who's the head of the church. And so who better to be able to teach us how to live this life. Yes, I'm thankful for the Apostle Pauls and the Peters and the Johns, but at the end of the day, we don't have them without Jesus. We don't have the great prophets of old. We don't have Moses and Abraham. We don't have Ezekiel and Isaiah without Jesus being concealed and then Jesus being revealed in the New Testament. And so Jesus is the ultimate example in showing us what it means to be a Christian, what it means to live according to the Father's will. And so I want to share the Messiah's mentality. We're going to learn over these next several weeks, months. We're going to go throughout this year learning to have the Messiah's mentality. We're going to learn how Jesus learned of God and how he taught about God and how he learned about humanity, how he loved God and humanity, and how he lived for God and before humanity. And so if you have your Bibles, you have your Bible on your phone, on your tablet, or if you got you, you like me, I got the Word of God right here in front of me. Turn to Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two, verses thirty-nine through fifty-two. Luke chapter two, verses thirty-nine through fifty-two. All right, and we're going to read read through that. Luke chapter two, verses thirty-nine through fifty-two. Let's look at Jesus's life. Now, Scripture only gives us so much about Jesus. You know, he was born in a manger. We know that he healed the sick. He raised the dead. We know that he taught with the authority of the Father. We know that he did great miracles like turning water into wine. He took, to, uh, took some fish, took some bread, fed four and 5,000 on two different occasions. So many great things that our Lord, as he walked the earth, 
done. But there's also periods of time that we don't see, that we uh, haven't read about because it's not detailed in scripture. But I want us to use our um, imagination. Can we, can we see Jesus as a young boy playing with his friends outside, just playing whatever Jewish customary games that they played at that time? And imagine one of his friends falling on the ground, possibly be even hurting themselves. Can you see Jesus in that moment, even though he was having a good time as a human being, because he was 100% God, 100% man, as a young boy, showing compassion in that moment, picking his friend up, and his friend instantly feeling better? Can you imagine Jesus running into the house, and Mary is probably cooking and cleaning and She's working on some projects, maybe even crafting possibly some things. And she's worn out, a little tired of the day. Because, you know, Jesus had siblings too. So she's also having to make sure the children are all doing what they're supposed to do. And can you see Jesus grabbing his mother's hand, looking her in her eyes and saying, I love you, mother. How she instantly feels better. Any soreness that she may have had in her body of moving about the day. She instantly feels better. Can you see Jesus in the middle of the night? Maybe one of his siblings wasn't feeling well and had a fever. And the young teen Jesus lays hands on one of his siblings and instantly the fever leaves. Can you see Joseph coming into the house after a hard day at work being a carpenter? Chopping wood, sawing on wood, sanding wood, making tables and chairs, building houses. He's doing all types of work and he's tired and worn out and his hands are sore. Maybe even got some cuts and some blisters and possibly even some splinters. And he lays down and sits on the recliner or whatever type of seating they had in that time that Jesus was living. And he lays hands on his father's hands. And immediately, not only does the soreness leave, but his hands feel good as new. His hands are now able to go back to work feeling better. I use those different examples to give us an imaginary, imaginary example of what it was like being around Jesus. I mean, imagine this. They got Jesus, God in the flesh, the one who created the heavens and the earth living with them. This is the same Jesus that in Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image. Who was God talking to? He was talking to his son. And he was talking to the same spirit that hovered over the waters of the face of the deep. I mean, this is great, great discussion and great conversation to not only see the God man, but also to see the son of man, the son of David, to see the not only the divinity of Jesus, but the humanity of Jesus. And so that's what we're going to be looking at as we get into the Messiah's mentality, developing his mindset how we should speak, how we should carry ourselves, how we should conduct ourselves, how we should live before the fa for the Father before others. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read the first couple of verses here that I have. Verse 39 and 40. When they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The boy, Jesus, grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom and God's grace was on him. So after we go from Matthew chapter 2 and even in here in Luke chapter 2, we see angels that have praised God, excited about the arrival of the birth of Jesus Christ. We see shepherds that were amazed to see the Christ, to see the Messiah, to see their Lord in the flesh. We see Simeon and Anna speak a prophetic word and praise and worship their king of kings and hold their lord of lords, being able to see the God in the flesh. We see the magi, the wise men, show up to worship and give gifts to the king of kings and the lord of lords, the God who created the heavens and the earth and the entire universe, including you and I. And then we have Mary and Joseph, his earthly parents, that he submitted and was subject to. He obeyed them. He, think about this. God obeying humanity. He lowered himself, took off his former glory, 
came from heaven to earth to show us the way. And he chose to obey two human beings that he made his parents. God has parents <laughs> in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's just things like that that should really wow us. And that's my, my hope and my prayer that we as the members of Thy Will Be Done Christian Church, we as the people of God, a part of the body of Christ as a whole, that we will allow God's word to wow us again. That we will allow God's word to amaze us again. I know a lot of us have been in church for a long time, been saved for a long time. But my hope is for someone who doesn't know Jesus, maybe this is the first time you've been hearing the gospel, or maybe it's been a while and you've been out of fellowship. Either way, I pray that we return to that first love from the first time we cracked open our Bible, the first time we downloaded that Bible app, the very first time we really prayed and we felt the presence of God overwhelm us and hold us. I pray we get back to that place where we allow God to amaze us again, where we see his wondrous works and his mighty acts, and we are excited about it. We are enthused about it. The old song says, I'm so excited and I can't hide it. We get back to that place where we're excited and we can't wait to share our faith, but continue to also grow in our faith. So we see Jesus growing up, growing strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Jesus grows up in Nazareth, a tough place, a impoverished place. Uh, some would call a ghetto, uh, an urban community, if you will. Uh, Jesus is born not into a rich or wealthy family in substance, but yet he is born into a family that's rich in faith. He grows up in a godly household. Joseph and Mary fear the Lord. They're servants of the Lord. They love God and they uh, acknowledge all of the different Jewish festivals of the Passover and eating of the unleavened bread. And they acknowledge the fact that they are a family of faith. Wealthy in faith, rich in godliness. And so even though Jesus is not born in a palace, God places him still in the best position. And that's a word for us to remind us that even though some of us probably didn't have the best upbringing or for any children that are even watching, maybe even now you're doing the very best you can to take care of your family, but you're still coming up a day late and a dollar short. But yet you have the bare necessities. The lights are still on. You're doing your very best to do that. Food is in the house. You all have clothing. But at the end of the day, the rich inheritance of passing down your faith in Jesus Christ, that's what we're thankful for. We're thankful for the men and women of God that passed down their faith to us. And even if it wasn't our earthly parents, maybe some of them dropped the ball, but thankful for the men and women in the church, thankful for the elders, regardless of what color they were. As long as they knew that the blood of Jesus was red and it was able to wash our sins away and they shared their faith with us and they mentored us and they imitated and mimicked Christ's likeness before us. We're thankful for the spiritual parents that God has given us or even the earthly parents like Jesus to make sure that we become everything that God has called us to be. And so that's our prayer. Just like Jesus grew in strength and in wisdom, and God's grace with on him, that's what we speak and desire not only for us, but even for our children, our sons and our daughters, that they will grow up in strength, not only in physical strength, but in mental and emotional strength, and that they will be filled with wisdom, which is knowledge applied of God's word, that they will have vision, that they will understand and know that they have a purpose, that they're fearfully and wonderfully made, that God has called them to be confident, not to fall to peer pressure, but to know how to respond like God does in the midst of peer pressure. But even in the midst, if they do make a mistake, remind them that they still belong to God, that they can still repent and they're not defined by their past. Why? Because God's grace is on them. Thank God for the grace. Thank God for his mercy. So through everything that Jesus has gone through at this point, now we get here in verse 41 says every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus, 12 years old, stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know. Now somebody may be like, oh no, Jesus stayed behind. He should have been with his parents. But check this out, because somebody may think, you know, Somebody may even argue that was a moment Jesus was even being disobedient in the text. 
Oh, the Bible contradicts itself. Let's keep reading. Verse 44, assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and their friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. Now, I know if this was me and my siblings back in the day, my mom would have been ready to get on our behind. She'd be ready to chew us out and probably even whoop us as well. But let's keep reading. <laughs> Just threw that out uh, for some our day-to-day -day modern reminders of, of knowing that uh, people don't always handle things the same as others. But verse 46, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Verse 51 and 52 in Luke chapter 2. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And when was obedient to them, his mother kept all the things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God, with people. I want y'all to catch a connection here. I love connecting dots, and I love how God's word does not contradict itself, but it complements itself. Catch this. So in verse 40, the Bible says the boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. All right, now let's go over to, to verse 52. And Jesus increased with what? Wisdom? <laughs> stature? Favor with God and people? Why is that? Catch that connection. He became strong in verse 40 and then even stronger in stature in verse 52. He was filled with wisdom in verse 40, but then he increased with wisdom in verse 52. God's grace was on him in verse 40. And then God's favor, which is which is grace, unmerited favor, was on him in verse 52 with God and people. Why? Because Jesus submitted himself to his parents. Let's go back and rewind the biblical text. All right. So Jesus travels on this festival with his family. He's 12 years old. And in Jewish custom, when you're 12, you're held accountable for your actions. So Jesus, even though he's 12, is already seen as a young man, according to Jewish law and custom. By the time he's 12, he has already memorized, even though he's the word made flesh and he knows all things. But as a child, every child, his age has already memorized the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They're very familiar with the Pentateuch, the five books of the law. They're very familiar with the prophets, the minor and the major prophets. Major because it's just more chapters, not major or minor because one's better than the other. So they know about Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They know about Micah and Zechariah and Malachi and Haggai. They know about the prophets. They know the word. They know the law. And Jesus concealed, who is now revealed in the New Testament, shows up as a young, young man in the text, 12 years old. And the Bible says that he is learning of the other teachers. And he's asking questions once again he is submitting himself to the authority that's around him, even though he's ultimately the greatest authority in the temple. <laughs> so Jesus is learning of the other teachers. Now, we know he's God in the flesh, so he knows all of our thoughts, right? But he's learning, I imagine, sitting back as a young, young man at 12 years old to see where the heart is postured to see where their mind is positioned, to see if they really believe what they're teaching. Because we know in today's times, even there are seminary professors who can teach all types of theology, Old and New Testament, teach Christian ethics, but yet they don't have a relationship with the spirit of the God that created all of these subjects to be taught in these seminaries around the world so that we can be effective as ministers and teachers and preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not for us just to hear the word. We got to be doers of it. So Jesus is sitting among these teachers, learning and asking questions, listening. The best way to learn a lot of times is to be quiet. Man, I love the moments when I sat in 
my pastor's office. And granted, yes, I'm an extrovert, so I do talk. But there are a lot of times I wouldn't say anything. Wouldn't be much of a reply. Because the wisdom of God was speaking through the man of God. And I sat there and I soaked it all in like a sponge. Let us be like Jesus at 12. Let us be that sponge. Let us never get so old or get so dull where we are not sponges to take in everything that God desires to teach us. I want God to saturate me with his grace and his mercy. And I want to soak up every drop of anointing, every bit and crumb of his word, every drop of the living water. I want to soak it all in. I want to take it in and get those spiritual nutrients for my life so that I can grow. And I pray the same for you, that you soak up everything that God gives you, that you don't let a sermon pass. You don't let a Bible study, a time in prayer, a time to fast, a time to fellowship with the people of God in the house of God or even virtually online without taking in fully everything that God wants us to have. So Jesus is learning, asking, and listening questions of the teachers around him. All right? His parents, they leave after a few days, and they realize, like, hold up. Where's our son? All of us, some of us have been able to relate to that. Maybe there was a time where you didn't know where your son or your daughter was. And imagine how you would feel or imagine how you felt if they were missing for a little bit. Maybe they were up the street or somebody's house they shouldn't have been or after school they went to go hang out with friends at the mall and they forgot to call you. Whatever the case may be, but imagine your heart is beating fast, your mind is racing, possibly thinking the worst of thoughts because we know this crazy world that we live in. And if they're a little bit older, we're hoping, man, I hope they apply what we taught them. But if they're a real small child, we're like, oh, Jesus, they're so innocent and we don't want anything to happen to them. So imagine how Joseph and Mary feels in that moment. Seeing or imagining Jesus being with the party, being with the caravan, traveling with the people back home, and he's not there. They get back to the temple because the Bible says, assuming he was traveling in the party, they went back a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among the relatives. He's nowhere to be found. When they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days. So they they traveled back a day's journey, but, but it still took them three days to find him. I know most of us as parents, even though we're, we're frantic in our minds and our hearts, our mindset is, when I find that boy, when I find that girl, ooh, Lord, protect them, Lord, keep them, and let me get my hands on them. Because I'm going to let them know and I'm going to show them that you don't ever do anything like that. But we see a different tone in the text. All right? We see a totally different scenario. Verse 47, it says, And all those who heard Jesus as he was asking questions, learning and all of that in the temple, they were amazed and astounded as an understanding. 48, when his parents show up, they were astonished. I don't know if they were astonished at what they heard or just for the simple fact that this is where you were all this time. Now, granted, it's a totally different time. Jesus don't have no cell phone. to be like, hey, mom and daddy, I'm going to be up at the temple. You know, I know y'all going to go back, but uh, I'm going to be over here doing my thing for the father in heaven. You know, y'all be cool. I'll be home when I can. No, he ain't no cell phones. All right. So here it is. His parents saw him. They were astonished. His mother said to him, son. Why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Going back to those day-to-day -day real human emotions, how we will feel if one of our children were missing. Verse 49. This is where we about to really even get any deep, deeper into this discussion. Okay, so why were you searching for me? He asked. I imagine Jesus didn't say that with a smart tone. I believe it was as respectful as possible. We talking about Jesus here, right? So, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house, but they did not understand what he said to them. So that question, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? King James says, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? So even though we don't get all of the different scenarios of Jesus's life in detail, like, like we, we get a whole lot, but the Bible says, I believe over in John that if every Scene of every second, minute, hour of Jesus' life could have been printed so that we can read it 
all the libraries in the world wouldn't be able to hold all that information. <laughs> We're talking about Jesus here, the author and finisher of our faith. So the author who writes the book of our lives, his life can't even be held in all of the libraries of the world if every moment of his life was written. But God is so good that the word made flesh also came in the written word and we have enough between Genesis and Revelation to make sure that we walk out his word in this life. Can't nobody do us like Jesus. That is a good God. That is a gracious God. That is a generous God. That is a God that is considerate, that is mindful of us. When the psalmist says, who am I that you are mindful of me? We have a God that is always mindful, not only of our yesterdays, but our todays and our tomorrows all at the same time. He sees the beginning from the end. And he sees the end from the beginning. <laughs> so Jesus says, didn't you know I had to be about my father's house? Which leads us to then ask, was there a prior conversation or conversations that Jesus had to have with his parents? I told you they're, 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 godly, they're a godly family, right? So they had to be had moments where they were talking about God's word in their home. And since they had God in the flesh that was, that was written about in the Old Testament sitting right in front of them, I just imagine there had to be some conversations that possibly happened. Listen to me. In this moment, I am trying to do my very best to do a good exegetical job in rightly dividing the word of truth, meaning that I'm not trying to add to or take away from Scripture. So I pray nobody takes this moment of teaching like I'm trying to add to or take away. I'm just trying us to, to get us to open up our imagination and see these moments like we watch movies. See these moments and imagine a conversation that Jesus is having with his parents at home about the word, living with the word made flesh. I'm not trying to isolate anything, meaning give the word my own interpretation and give you my own opinion on what I think the word says. No, I'm giving you exactly what God is saying in the text. Also, in adding, using our imagination. Because to ask a question, did you know that I had to be about my father's business? Why were you searching for me? Why would Jesus at 12 ask his parents that question? They had to already know that this moment was coming. They probably didn't know specifically what day. Just like we don't know the day nor the hour that the son of man is going to come back. But we know he's coming back, right? So when Jesus comes back, it's not like we're going to be like, whoa, whoa, wait. Um, what's up, Jesus? I didn't know you was coming. The only ones that are going to be like that are those that are unbelievers. The only people that are going to be like, whoa, wait. So it was true? Everything about the gospel and Jesus and the cross and him getting up was true. I thought it was make-believe. I thought it was a fantasy. I thought it wasn't real. Those are the only people that are going to be like that. And we were like that once upon a time. We were skeptics. We questioned the word. Even when we heard the word. Maybe even believed it, but we didn't always obey it. But thanks be unto God for his grace. He's brought us into his family. And he has shown us, even though we've searched all over. Drugs couldn't do it. Alcohol couldn't do it. Different ungodly relationships couldn't do it. Our own thought process couldn't do it. Getting more money couldn't do it. Getting more stuff couldn't do it. Nobody but Jesus could fulfill the eternal void because only, only an eternal God can fill an eternal void. So, using our imagination, why would Jesus ask these questions unless there already had to be a prior conversation with his parents about what he did in this moment in the text? Why are you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? But the Bible says in verse 50, they didn't understand what he was saying. There's times that God desires to do things in our lives and we just don't understand. God, why are you calling me to do this? God, why are you leading me to this? Maybe like Jesus in the text, you're searching for something. God has called you to do great things, but you're searching. You're looking around like, God, I'm... 
maybe you're over here. Let me search over here. Well, well, maybe you're over there. I mean, imagine jo like Joseph and Mary were doing. They, they, they searched. They went back a day's journey, searched for three days looking for Jesus, and then they finally found him. But as each day went by, I imagine they were getting more and more frustrated, more and more sad, more and more bothered, irritated, worried. But Jesus asked, why are you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? There had to be a prior conversation. I just truly believe it. That he shared with them. But just like us as human beings, sometimes we get a little amnesia. Sometimes we forget. And I believe in their forgetting, this was their reminder. That's right. As much as he is a boy, as much as he's grown to be a young man, as much as he is a human being, He's also God in the flesh. As much as he has parents on earth, he ultimately has a father in heaven. And there may be times that God will lead us to do some things that our parents may not even agree with. Our parents that know God, that taught us about God, that taught us to pray to God, that led us in the word of God, showed us how to worship and praise God led us and took us into the house of God. There may come a time that God may do something through you, young man, young woman, and your parents may not agree. And like Jesus, we can be respectful enough to say, mom and daddy, don't you remember I had to be about my father's house? Why are you searching for me? Why are you still looking for me to live or act this way? God has instructed me. God has led me. God has spoken to me. And I know he has. And I know you don't fully see how God is doing or what he's doing. But this is God. Because when God does something totally different with our children than how he led us in the Lord, that's when we start worrying. That's when we start questioning our head. We, were like, oh. <laughs> we start questioning our mind and scratching our head. Excuse me. And finding ourselves like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing with that boy. Even if the even if some of the stuff, or it could be sinful, wrong. But we got to trust, hey, we're raising them or have raised them right. For you that have, have adult children, and pray for them. Because if you train up a child in the way they should go, they won't depart. They may try to stray. But believe you me, those conversations in God that we have with our sons and daughters, even in times when they don't want to hear it. It's going beyond their flesh and their ears and it's reaching their spirit and their soul. And that seed, God's word, cannot go back to him void. But it will accomplish the mission that it was sent for. If heaven is a bank, ain't a check that came out of heaven ever bounced. Never. We serve a limitless God that has limitless blessings. Full of overflow. So when we're speaking to our children, regardless if they are adults or they're growing to be young adults, young boys and girls yet to be teens, we still got to believe and trust that God has his hand on them. If we're doing our part now as parents, because as much as we provide food, clothing, and shelter, make sure they get to school and take care of their assignments, spend time with them, let's do our job as Christian parents and teach our children about Jesus. Not just from our lips, but through our lives. Be those living examples. And guess what? Some of the best lessons you can teach, some of the best lessons that we can teach, I'm going to include us because I'm a parent as well, is even when we make a mistake, that's some of the best lessons that we can teach our children to show them how to handle life when they make mistakes. Repent. Apologize ask for forgiveness, make things right, and desire to be more accountable, responsible, and consistent with living a Christ-like life, depending not on our own strength, but on the Holy Spirit's strength. I just believe a prior conversation had to happen. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Yes, Joseph and Mary were his earthly parents, but God is always his father. We, you and I both have parents, did the very best they could to take care of us. Single parent homes, two parent homes, adopted, 
foster care. Someone, grandmother, grandfather, somebody took care of us. We're our guardians. They did the very best they could. Regardless if you grew up in church or not. Regardless if you came to the facility of worship or not. But God, ultimately, he is our father. He's the one to lead and guide and direct us. Now, that doesn't mean I take heed to the wisdom that God will give our parents. But here's the thing. When God is leading you and you've grown mature in your walk, and your parents, out of worry sometimes, will share some things because they don't want you to make any mistakes, that's when we as parents, because my children are still younger now, they're not teens yet, but me and my wife constantly have these conversations and these discussions. And, and it's very important to have to game plan how we're going to respond to the day-to-day -day scenarios that our children are just a part of, good or bad. So that we can then trust God to then entrust them to be able to make smart decisions. And even when they don't, show them the same grace that God shows us. So that when it comes a time that they're mature in their faith and they're consistently showing godliness in their life, when they come to us and say, hey, this is what I believe God is leading me to do with my career, with my family, with my calling. We can sit back and say, we're praying for you. We believe in God. And we don't have to worry because why? God is ultimately their father. I'm the daddy to my children, but God is ultimately their father. When they were born, my wife and I dedicated them back to the Lord. They belong to God. Our children belong to that's what Jesus is conveying to Joseph and Mary I belong to the father yes I'm in your care I'm going to respect you you're my parents but remember my ultimate mission verse 50 says they didn't understand what he said and how quickly we forget the things that God reveals to us let's go back the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary tells her that she's going to be impregnated by the Holy Ghost, that the divine seed of Elohim is going to grow within her womb. The same angel speaks to Joseph, tells her, listen, don't put Mary away. She's a woman of faith, blessed among women, full of hope, full of grace, full of truth. And the way the truth of the life is growing inside her womb. You're going to raise that boy as your son. Name him Jesus because he's coming to save the world from their sins. Here come the shepherds. Huh. <laughs> Here come the wise men handing out gifts. Here come Simeon and Anna at the temple. All of these words of confirmation of Christ that was spoken of of the Old Testament. Did they forget? Let's not be hard on them at all. Because think about all of the great, wonderful, powerful, anointed words we received in different seasons of our lives. We forgot them. We walked around with spiritual amnesia. How do I know? Because some of us have made some decisions and some choices, even in salvation, let alone before we were saved, that we know that God did not lead us into. Why? Because we lack spending that time with our father. The more time you spend with your father, the more you will act like your father. But the less and less time we spend with God the father, the less and less we will act like him. That's how carnality is able to become us. The Bible says that as it is in our minds, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And out of the issues of the heart, the mouth speaks. So God has to have our, we have to have the Messiah's mentality. God has to have our mind. That's why over in Deuteronomy, they said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. The two greatest commandments, love God, love people, love your neighbor as yourself. But I can't properly love people if I don't first love God. And first, I don't allow him to love me. All of me. That intimate relationship where we bear ourselves before God. Where we open ourselves up to God and say, God, this is who I am. He already knows. But just like Jesus in the temple with the teachers, listening, learning, and asking, he is surveying and examining the hearts. Are we really teaching right? Are we really living right? Do we really believe the words that come out of our mouths? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Are our words and our actions and our thoughts 
and our daily livelihood is it acceptable to God Jesus is showing us in this scripture as a young man a young boy to man <laughs> how to be about the father's business at a young age that's a reminder for us as parents to our children there's never a bad time to teach our children about Jesus. Now, some of us will be like, nah, they look too young to know about the deep things of God. Listen, your son and daughter play video games that have all types of stuff, and some of the stuff is crazy. They, they, they've seen movies that have revealed all types of walks of life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Don't tell me <laughs> what's too deep for our children. Okay, I'm not saying don't monitor what your children watch, but if we're going to allow our children to watch certain movies that probably got a little violence in it or play video games that can sometimes be brutal, all right, then we can take time to teach our children about Jesus. I remember I worked at the 14th and Chestnut Center in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, I was a much younger, younger man at that time. Still young. <laughs> but anyway, and... Me and some other uh, counselors wanted to show the movie The Passion of the Christ. If you remember that movie, uh, Mel Gibson brought that movie out. And uh, great, great, great depiction. Probably one of the best depictions I've seen of definitely of uh, Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane going to the cross and getting up from the grave. All right. Probably one of the best images that we would see. And some of the people at the center had an issue with it. Really thought it would be too much. Now, mind you, this is a church. This is a Christian organization, but some of the people thought it would have been a little inappropriate to show the children the passion of the Christ, thinking that would be too graphic. Well, if we're sharing Bible scriptures with them, telling them that he died, children are very curious. They want to know why. Why did Jesus have to die? How did he die? When did he die? Why did he die for me? Children are very inquisitive. They're going to ask questions. They're curious. So I get it. I understand. Oh, it's too violent. It's too much. But with the music, that's very graphic. And that could be too much. With the movies, that could be graphic and way too much. With life, real life, that we can see, that could be graphic and way too much and explicit. i rather show my children me and my wife rather show our children even the good, the bad, and the ugly of people's lives in Scripture and show them the right way on how to see it through God's lens. Aside from just leaving them to learn on their own about what's going on in life, we rather sit down with our children and whatever we listen to, whatever we watch, whatever we see, being able to teach them what God is saying through the good, the bad, and the ugly of life. When things look pretty and when things look horrible, when things are looking great and when they're terrible, either way, we want to be able to have a kingdom agenda, God's perspective on how we see life. That's what Jesus is showing us in this text. So even though Joseph and Mary in verse 50 say, man, we don't understand what's going on with this boy. Obviously, they have forgotten what God had already revealed to them. Why did they forget? Well, I imagine those few days of not seeing where Jesus was caused them in the moment to forget about his true mission. Sometimes we can go through some of the most hardest, difficult things. A moment of doubt can get us to forget about everything God revealed to us, about everything that God has called us to do. One day we're shouting, yes, God, I submit to your will. I, I submit to your will. I submit to your way. But then, yeah, I submit to your meal, too, because the word of God is spiritual food. But uh, I love how God can even take our fumbles and words and still, and still make it good for his glory. But anyway, one day we're excited about God, and then another day we're like, God, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you called me to do. I'm, I'm not sure I'm qualified. I'm not even sure I'm saved. Listen, you're saved. Jesus said nobody can pluck us out of his hand once we're in his hands. You belong to him. Don't believe that lies of the enemy. Jesus came to redeem us so the moment in the Garden of Eden doesn't have to happen again. Don't believe Lucifer's lies. Resist the devil's bread. Turn these stones into bread. Resist it. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Don't believe his lies. Believe what God says. Even if it hasn't come to pass yet, believe it. Jesus wasn't a full grown man, but he was a young man that was already sure of his call. Sure of his purpose. Don't allow worry and doubt and insecurities and frustration. Don't allow impatience, because I've done it, to keep you from staying focused on the course. Stay the course. Stay focused on the vision of what God has called you to do. Verse 51 and verse 52, Luke chapter 2. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. Oh, man. His mother kept all these things in her heart. So Mary did the same thing that she did when she heard the word from Gabriel, who's the angel of the word. Okay? She kept all these things in her heart. And she said, be it unto me as you have said. I'm going to be impregnated with the divine seed of Elohim, who is God, who is Lord, so be it. Even though Joseph and Mary didn't fully understand, they still chose, the Bible says Mary, kept these things in her heart. Maybe Joseph was still upset. I don't know. <laughs> but at the end of the day, she kept these things in her heart. And the Bible says that Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, favor with God and people. Why? Because Jesus submitted himself. Jesus taught us how to submit ourselves under authority. We see that in two different instances in scripture. While he's in the temple, he's listening, learning, and asking questions. Submit under authority. Even though he's the greatest authority in the temple, he is the creator of the temple. He's the true Israel. He's the great I am. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth, the master of the universe. But he's submitting himself under authority. The authority under God the Father and the authority that God had gave the teachers in the temple. Then that translates to his home life. Because in order to be able to submit to the other authorities around us, be it in the church, be it in government, be it in our school systems, be it wherever we go. Just because I'm a believer doesn't mean I can go into Walmart and tear it up because I'm a believer and I got authority, power, and dominion. No, there's a manager there. They have the authority. Your boss, our bosses on our job, our supervisors, they have the authority. Now, somebody may be saying, well, they're not saved. What are they not saved? They still are in authority. You're not in the position. And the way God will bless us, like Jesus, to be strong, to be filled with wisdom, for his favor to be on us, is submission. That's what this whole text from verse 39 to 52 the blessing of having the Messiah's mentality is submission. I got to be willing to submit to authority. Maybe that's why some of us are not as blessed as we could be. Not just with material things, but with more in terms of being able to lead out front. Maybe some of us really desire to lead out front. Well, you can't be a good leader if you're not a good follower. And God is not going to elevate in any aspect, shape, or form if we're not willing to then submit to the humble beginnings of working our way up. You can't appreciate the mountaintop and get into the peak until you first pray and press and push your way through the valley. Because it's in the valley that you grow. You don't grow on a mountaintop because when you're at the peak, there's no other place to go. You're not developing any strength on the mountaintop. And see, that's the thing. A lot of us try to live on mountaintop experiences, but we can't survive up there. Why? Because the air is really thin. But the way God develops our spiritual lungs and our spiritual arms and our legs and our determination and motivation to keep going is in the valley. Because it's in the valley that we learn how to pray. It's in the valley that we know how to really praise and press and worship. It's in the valley that we learn how to stand on the word of God. It's in the valley where we learn how to fight in the spirit. 
It's in the valley that strengthens our faith muscle to climb the mountain and even have the faith to speak to the mountain. And if it's in his will, it shall be removed. Why? Because that's where we are developed. God is developing us. Thy will be done. God is developing us, people of God, children of God, so that we become everything that God has called us to be. So, we can grow stronger in physical, mental, and emotional stature, be filled with wisdom, and increase in wisdom. Grow in stature and have God's favor on us because we're willing to submit. I know I am where I am right now because I've submitted myself under some great pastors. I wasn't trying to usurp their authority. I wasn't trying to run and get their seat. Listen, I didn't even want to preach, let alone pastor. I was good with driving a church van and working with the youth. And I mean that with my whole heart. I'm doing this right now. We're engaging in this conversation. I have been blessed to operate in the office of a pastor, according to 1 and 2 Timothy, all because of his grace. You've been blessed to be in the position you're in, in the church and operating outside the church. Whatever you do for a living in your profession, by his grace and mercy alone. I tell my children this all the time. Even if you're an entrepreneur, you still got to submit to the IRS. <laughs> and ultimately, all of us still got to answer to God. My man Flame, Marcus Gray, great rapper. Look him up on Instagram, Facebook. Great music. I've been listening to him since 2004. He has a part on his song where he says, Seek God now and know him as Savior, or seek him later and only know him as Judge. Some people are going to submit to God now as Lord and Savior. Some people are only going to submit to his authority when they have to stand before him as Judge. God wants us to hear the seven words of reception. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I believe it'll grieve God the day where he has to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I know you're not. Because the Bible says God so loved the world. So if he loves us, why would he want to tell us depart from him? Because some of us are walking around like we don't know him. And Jesus said, if you deny me before people, I would deny you before the Father. I can't deny my children if I wanted to and I don't want to. They have me and my wife's facial features, personality traits. They have our DNA. They have my name. I can't deny them. When God looks at us, he made us. He created us. He can't deny us, even when we deny him, because he made us. We have his spiritual DNA. We're marked with his divine personality traits through Jesus Christ. We have his divine characteristics through Jesus Christ. That's why we have his Holy Spirit. So that in this process of sanctification, we daily look like, walk like, talk like, act like Jesus. But we got to learn how to submit to authority. That's the word for tonight. Part one of developing the Messiah's mentality is submitting to the proper authorities that God has placed around us. I pray you were richly blessed by the word of God on tonight. I thoroughly enjoyed myself and I thank God for each and every person that takes time out of their schedule to virtually tune in to what God has to say through this wavy head preacher and I will be done Christian church. I'm so thankful unto God for you. If you desire to give unto this ministry a monetary blessing, Go to Cash App, dollar sign, that will be done, CC. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. God bless you so much. We're going to pray out, and then we're going to enjoy the rest of our evening with our families. Father, we thank you. We bless you, God, for those that tune in and hear your word. We thank you for your presence and your power. God, you are awesome. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who walked the earth, to show us how to live a life that's pleasing unto you. A life that was not attached, nor possessed, nor controlled by material possessions or even people's opinions. But God, by your word and your word alone.
that's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And the light of the world came to the world, walked on earth to show us the way. And he's still working now, seated at your right hand, that we may be your righteousness in the earth. Father, we love you. Bless those who are choosing or who have given to this ministry monetarily. Help us to be wise stewards over what you placed in our hand, God, to be a blessing not only in-house but also in the community. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We bless you and we thank you now. Till we gather and meet again virtually in your house. We bless you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and continue to walk in God's will for your life. Have a good evening.